so here we are in the uh, uh, the next stage those seedlings that I had talked about in the previous video um, you know we had planted the seeds and at this point you can see uh, that they're taking off that we're doing pretty good now like I talked about previously um, you generally want to avoid the paper towel method it is nice because you can make sure the seed pops before you put it in each plant site um, but the uh, problem is that it can stress out the roots by tearing off the micro roots um, you know in this case because we're growing uh, we're growing cherry tomatoes here a lot of times I'll start with two seeds if your seeds are very low cost and um, you know you, you have a lot of them you can start with two seeds and then once one pops you can pull um, you can pull the extra seed out now I'm just going to show you real quick um, you know it looks like even though these plants are about uh, five days old uh, from the point when we transplanted seeds so you can see they're doing extremely well in the unit now you can kind of see in this video here that there is a small hairline root that's already popping out from the net pot. Now in the uh, coming weeks here um, this net pot will be just loaded with roots uh, extending down into the water and that root will both help wick water up to the uh, spongy cube at the top here and also help the plant take up nutrients. Now <clears throat> our air stone in the bottom you can see is still bubbling uh, that really is super important you want to make sure that that air stone is clean and that it's bubbling the water at all times. If for some reason it's not bubbling, um, what you can do is take that air stone and soak it in bleach uh, for about an hour, then rinse it off thoroughly, make sure all the bleach is removed, and you can put it back and that'll clear off. Sometimes there's organic residue that'll build up on it. Uh, so again, you can see here with the seedlings, we're doing really nice. Uh, the lights are working well, everything's going, going pretty good. Now for a moment here I want to cover uh, the fan filter and how to replace that. If you take and you pop out this little plastic exterior you can see that you have a fan filter insert. Now over time because it is pulling uh, a lot of air through you're going to want to take uh, this filter and just uh, put it in uh, your sink and just clean it with normal tap water and soap and then put it back in place after it's dried off. Again that just snaps right back on and you're all set. So that's important too. Uh, make sure your air pump, you should feel a slight vibration. Um, but we talked about before, it's not very loud. Uh, as you can hear in this video, it's, um, it's very quiet. So everything's going well. Um, again, keys are make sure your water level is about halfway up these cubes until all the roots extend down into the water. And then it's not as big a deal. Um, if your water level drops just a little bit it won't hurt anything um, but it is really critical in this early stage to keep that water level up because if these cubes dry out uh, you will have major problems your seeds will die and that will be it you'll have to start over alright so in this video I'm going to talk about light cycles a little bit <clears throat> and uh, about some of the tips and tricks you can do depending on uh, your plant type every plant has a different life cycle and we're going to kind of touch base on that a little bit. Now uh, when you're dealing with some plants, you know, most plants like tomatoes and vegetables, um, you know your, your garden variety uh, plants, you can have your lights on uh, with your timer uh, which we had talked about in the one video as far as how to use that. You can keep the light on for anywhere between 18 and 24 hours a day. Um, you know the uh, jury's still out as to whether that extra six hours between 18 and 24 really makes a difference or not. Some people say yes, some people say no. Either way, it seems like if there is an improvement, it's moderate. Uh, maybe in the neighborhood of a 15 to 20 percent increase, um, but not much. Not as much as that main required 18 hours a day of light. Um, so again, tomatoes, um, peppers, varieties like that, you can just have the light uh, on 18 hours a day, start to finish. You can use either the grow or the bloom bulbs or do a mix of grow and bloom. I like to do two grow and one bloom. Um, it just gives a little more variety in the spectrum, but again, it doesn't really matter with vegetables. Now there's other plants that are more specific uh, as far as their light cycles and the process that they'll go through, and then having uh, grow versus bloom, bloom bulbs makes uh, a fairly big difference. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, with uh, other varieties of plants that are uh, photoperiod sensitive, you typically want to have your lights on uh, 24 hours a day in the beginning when your plants are seedlings until um, when they're about a third of the way up the box. Uh, so, you know, in this box here, we're talking in the neighborhood of about uh, 10 to 12 inches. 
So at the 10 to 12 inch point, when your plants get that big, you're going to switch your lights uh, from being all grow bulbs to all bloom bulbs. And then you're going to take your light timer and go from 24 hours a day of constant light to 12 hours a day of light on and 12 hours a day of light off. Now it's really important that you go from 24 hours to 12, 12, 12 hours on and 12 hours off again. And the reason being because you're taking a very long photo period and shrinking it in half. Um, when you do that it causes your plants to click into flowering faster and it makes sure that there isn't a delay. If you go from 18 to 12 hours, it takes about an extra 30 or 40 percent for your plants to actually flower and that can slow things down and cause problems. So in the case of plants that are photo sensitive, photo period sensitive, again, the key is to make sure you go from 24 hours of light to 12, uh, 12 on, 12 off. And the reason you switch from grow to bloom is grow bulbs. Uh, you can kind of see in the video here, the middle one is a little more red, that's the bloom bulb. Um, they're different Kelvin ratings. And what that means is these are a little more in the blue spectrum and this is a little more in the red. Now as far as your plants go, what you're doing is, uh, you can think of the blue spectrum as a sunny day in the middle of summer. Um, as far as the plant's genetics are concerned, it simulates summer. The bloom bulb is more orange and that simulates fall. Um, the reason being uh, the earth, the way it rotates, as um, you know, as uh, you move from the equator north or south, um, particularly in the case of, of moving north, your light cycle gets more red. You get more red as the light bounces through the or bounces off the atmosphere and through it, and you get more red light. So what you're doing by switching to bloom is telling the plants that winter's coming and that the season is fall and that they need to flower quickly before it gets too cold and they die of you know frost and freezing. So you're in a way uh, basically telling the plants genetically, hey, it's no longer summer, fall is coming, we went from 24 hours of light to 12 hours of light, the, the days are getting shorter, you need to hurry up and produce flowers and seeds quickly. Um, so that is an important thing to consider as well when you're doing uh, your flowering. Now typically with photosensitive plants, in the case of males, um, they'll have a round bulbous uh, type of uh, append, uh, a round bulbous type of sexual organ called, um, oh, excuse me here, the female one is a pistol, the male one is a pollen sac. And you'll see the pollen sacs, what it'll look like, you'll have uh, inner nodes, the place between where uh, the leaves come out of your stem and that's where you'll see um, pistils which will be thin wispy hairs uh, they, they look like just little wisps or you'll see a bulbous pollen sac now typically you want to take out the pollen sacs uh, excuse me the male plants that have the pollen sacs just take them right out because once those pollen sacs crack open uh, they cause the all the female plants the pistils will get pollinated and then your plant will produce seeds. So if your goal is um, to produce seeds, then leave the males in by all means. Uh, but typically the males are not as sought after, um, you know, they're not as valuable, and the females will get pollinated and waste their energy producing seeds and take, instead of taking that energy and producing flowers and leaves and more plant material. So typically, if you got males, kick them out. Um, now some plants, um, plant varieties out there are uh, feminized so that way you don't have to worry about there being males for the most part, but you still want to check every other day, you know, usually every 48 hours to look for signs of uh, sex organs, the pistils or the pollen sacs after you start the flowering. So again, just to recap, your plants are 10 to 12 inches tall, you switch from grow to bloom, you keep moving the light up. Uh, so the light is a couple inches away and not burning the gr uh, grow tips. The rule of thumb as far as your light and how close it is, you typically, if it's not too warm uh, for your hand, it's not too warm for the plants. So, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, with these bulbs, they're, you know, it starts to get uncomfortable if you squeeze them, but, you know, at half an inch to an inch away, uh, they won't burn your plants. So you want to have them fairly close uh, from start to finish as they're growing. Again, 10 to 12 inches, do your flowering, look, look for signs of uh, uh, the sex organs and pull out the males.
keep the females, switch from your grow to blue bulbs, make sure your timer is on 12 hours of light on, 12 hours of light off, and then just keep watching your plants grow and keep moving your light up as they're in the box. Now what will happen is your plants get taller, um, you know, if you were growing plants in soil, they would require staking um, and, you know, sometimes ties uh, to keep the plants from falling over. Now, what you do is, as your plants get bigger, just lean them against the insides of the box. The way the box is, when you have um, a fairly narrow environment like this, the plants will support each other and just grow uh, right up the box uh, from start to finish. You'll just have to be careful when you open the door. Um, you can see there again the nice light seal. You'll just want to be careful that the plants don't come outwards. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll take and um, you know put a, maybe a little screw hook in either side and run just a, a piece of twine across the front of the box just to prevent the plants uh, from falling out in the case of the cash cab here. Um, but you know they'll they'll do just fine. Now if you run into a scenario where your plants you forget to flower them, they're getting too tall and it's getting out of control, you can use plant growth inhibitors. Um, there's one called Bushmaster that keeps your plants a little shorter and bushier and denser. Now there's kind of conflicting info on whether plant growth inhibitors are dangerous for people that consume or smoke the plants in the case of like let's say tobacco um, however um, that's been as far as I'm aware uh, it isn't something that's been conclusively shown to cause any physical problem it's mostly been anecdotal concerns um, that people have so I think you're pretty safe to use a, blank, a plant growth inhibitor in the case of your plants getting too tall um, so with the Bushmaster though, if you do use a plant growth inhibitor like that product line, uh, which you can get from Dealzer, the only thing is uh, make sure to always uh, be very gentle with it. If you do too much, you can stunt your, your plants and cause major problems. So be very careful on that as well. Um, some other things to use, uh, spray and grow is great for uh, spraying on the leaves and doing foliar feeding. The only thing you want to be careful of, you typically don't want to spray them so much that they get moldy or mildewy. Um, if you have lots and lots of moisture on your leaves, um, what's going to happen is uh, they can get powdery mildew and mold. So foliar feeding can add as much as 20-30% to your yield. Um, so it is worth doing. Um, it gives the plant micronutrients and it absorbs through uh, stomata, which are these little open and close um, these little mechanisms in the plant leaves that breathe and they open and close and also take in uh, nutrients uh, through the moisture on the leaves as well. Uh, they're kind of like your lungs breathing uh, for the plant. So foliar feeding works well. Spray and grow in my experience has been one of the best products as far as that goes. Again, just make sure not to uh, use it too much. If you see any kind of mold or mildew, uh, cease using it immediately. As far as um, pests, pests can be a really big problem, uh, particularly in any kind of uh, indoor grow. And the main things that I've always found are the most critical are root rot, uh, which is where your roots will turn like a dark sticky brown and they'll get slimy and dissolve in your hands. Um, so that's not uncommon. If you have, in the case of uh, an air bubbler here, like I showed you earlier, where the water's oxygenated, that almost never happens. Um, it occasionally will happen if your water temperatures are real high, like in the 90 degree mark, and if there's no uh, bubbling of the water, then the chances of getting root rot, which is a bacterial disease, uh, increase dramatically. So you definitely want to avoid that. Uh, spider mites, um, as far as insects, are a fairly common uh, problem, probably the biggest pest of any indoor greenhouse scenario. Um, when dealing with uh, spider mites, you know, I've had people ask me what the best solution is. And, you know, it's complex. Um, you can use spider mite predators, which are uh, little bugs that will actually eat the spider mites and uh, feast on them like little robots. The only problem is that the predators take a long time to get established and to, to grow in uh, fast enough numbers to really take the spider mite population down. So they're good in the case of a very large greenhouse where you have a large amount of them that you're putting on consistently. But in the case of something like this, um, they're really not effective. Uh, the best product, in my opinion, is neem oil. It uh, tends to keep the insects away before there's a problem. Uh, you can take neem oil, just follow the directions on the bottle, 
any brand of it's fine and what it does you just spray it on the leaves and it keeps the insects off uh, they don't like it it tends to uh, disrupt their life cycles and cause them problems so that's really the best product to use um, things like foggers like dr doom foggers um, pyrethrin sprays that's the active ingredient it's called pyrethrin it's uh, a chrysanthemum flower extract and you find it in everything from lice control uh, for little kids uh, for their hair um, to plant products and the problem with it is that spider mites build up a tolerance uh, to pyrethrins uh, the main um, active ingredient so most of the spider mites in indoor greenhouses it might knock down 10 or 20 percent but it won't do much else so you can see that in products like don't bug me by fox farm and again they're okay for spot treatments and they'll help a little bit but not much um, so i would stay away from them as far as insect killing soaps uh, they're nice because they're fairly organic there's no residues or solvents and there's no it's not a real pesticide it's just soap uh, so that's nice, particularly in the last stages. Um, there are things you can use that are systemic uh, pest controls, like a product called Azimax um, is a systemic. A systemic means that the plants take it up right into the stem and the leaves, and when uh, an insect bites them, uh, the insect eats the poison and it kills them. The problem with systemics is they're not really healthy for people. And while you can flush them out to a point uh, in the final stages, it's still kind of a dangerous uh, game, and it's something that I wouldn't recommend unless you have a really, really bad insect problem. Um, other things like fungus gnats are like these little bugs that'll fly up um, when you kind of like shake your hand uh, near the base of the plants. You tend to see those in soil more, and since this is a hydro system, you might see them um, in those pods. They could get in there, but it's pretty unlikely. The problem with them isn't when they're flies, it's uh, they lay eggs on uh, these pods or again in soil and the eggs uh, turn into larvae and the larvae eat the roots. So they basically will chew up and consume all your roots. So that's where the problem uh, really lies whenever you're dealing with fungus gnats. So um, you know that's something that you want to avoid too. Other things like aphids, thrips, white flies, things like that. Um, you know, they're all possible, but usually they're not a big deal in most indoor greenhouses. You can get, um, there's yellow sticky traps, and, you know, you can take a yellow trap and, and hang it. It's just like a little sticky surface. You can just pop it in uh, one of these hooks and hang it. And if you see anything on the yellow sticky track, uh, trap, just identify what it is online and then deal with it accordingly. Uh, but, you know, if you're fairly clean in your environment, you shouldn't have too much of a problem. Now, it is important to mention also, uh, in the light cycles, when you're in the flowering, do not open up this box. Um, as soon as you open it, even if the light's off inside, you're going to find that you'll disrupt the life cycle for those photosensitive plants. So when you set your timer, you want to make sure to set it so that you know the timer has the light on during the the period when you would normally check your plants if you check your plants and the lights on in the room uh, that the box is in it'll screw up the life cycle and uh, really mess up your plants and cause all kinds of problems um, there's a lot of other uh, very complex things that can come up over time uh, but that's kind of the basics for now uh, that we'll cover um, at this point when your plants are a couple inches tall you can start to use the uh, green pad, uh, the CO2 generator uh, that we had talked about in the uh, first video, which you, uh, again, can take and put on a little hook and hang up right here. So it's, uh, and again, you spray these with water uh, to activate them. Um, so now at this point, you can start to use it to get a little benefit from the CO2. It's not really worth it to use the CO2 when your seeds are first popping, uh, since it makes so little difference. Uh, but at this point, um, you know, it would start to uh, have a noticeable uh, improvement. Now, again, make sure to change your water out frequently. You've got to change that water out every five to seven days uh, to make sure there's no nutrient in, uh, instability, make sure everything's balanced. Um, so, again, these plants are growing moon dust. We're just about four days old. And you can see, um, you know, the moon dust amount that we talked about in the beginning, um, just a very little bit and uh, everything's doing really wonderful so uh, yeah we'll keep you posted and uh, i'll keep uh, following up here and show you uh, down the road how things are looking thanks for watching